In today's video, we're going to take a look at the changes which have been made to the UK drone code by the CAA. On December 7th, 2022, so just a day before recording this video, the UK CAA have published a new edition of their CAP 722 document, the associated sub documents with lots of guidance and policy, and adopted their acceptable means of compliance, providing lots of legal definitions, all of which needs to be factored into your flight. However, the principles of your drone flight, as you know them, are the same and the basic rules we follow are mainly unchanged. In this series of videos, which we started yesterday discussing visual line of sight, I'm breaking down the key information you need to know. So, and I don't like asking this in every video, but it's an important series. If you're new here and would like to hear more about these changes, then subscribe to get notified about my future videos. And thank you to my regulars who hit the like button nice and early on the last video. It helped a lot. I'd really appreciate it again. Right, sorry, that's the annoying YouTuber bits out of the way, I promise. As part of rolling out all of this new information, including extending the transitional period, the CAA have made an update to the drone code. To save you fishing through and finding the updates today, we're gonna to go through them and explain any impact this has on your drone flight. It is important because if you need an operator ID or a flyer ID, to fly your drone, then the code is what you are agreeing to follow. So understanding it really is important. Here we have the page showing the December 2022 published amendments to the drone and model aircraft code. Firstly, it confirms that the updates reflect the Department for Transport's decision to extend the transition and legacy provisions in the open category to the 1st of January 2026 and remove the automatic recognition of class marks issued within this EU as equivalent to UK class marks from the 23rd of December 2023. The sections that change are then listed. A lot of the changes focus on the removal of the class marks, something which if we look at the getting what you need to fly legally page certainly cleans things up and means this update of the drone code is based on where and what you can actually fly today. Point two has been updated to show the update we brought you in the first video in this series, namely visual line of sight and needing to see your drone clearly enough that you can tell which way it is facing. So as we've covered that fully, I'll move on. Points four and six have been updated to remove class marks, but point six, which talks about keeping 150 meters from residential, recreational, commercial, and industrial sites has an interesting update. Content added to examples of residential sites to clarify that the point applies to individual and small groups of buildings. Terms area change to sites to help with clarification. So the change here is for people flying in the A3 subcategory with a drone over 250 grams without any certification such as the A2 CFC. It changes the understanding in terms of keeping 150 meters away from residential, recreational areas, etc., to include an individual residential building. So no longer a classification of congested area, etc. Just one residential building means you have to keep 150 meters away. Again, that is with a drone over 250 grams and if you do not hold an A2 CFC. This is a video about the drone code, so I'm not going to deviate too much from it, but it would be remiss of me not to mention at this point that this does not impact on those flying under the Article 16 authorization via groups like the excellent FPV UK. I stress that as the recreational aspect of point six discussed here can be flown under that authorization with a much reduced separation. Point eight of the drone code, follow any restrictions and check for hazards, has been updated to include emergency incidents. Content updated to enhance the details on not flying at or near incidents. Looking at the page itself and the emergency incident section now reads, you must keep out of the way and not fly in any way that could hamper the emergency services when they're responding to an emergency incident. If you're out flying at or near to an emergency incident when it happens, you must safely and immediately stop flying unless the emergency services give you permission to continue. You must follow any temporary restrictions that are put in place. There can be temporary restrictions put in place very quickly by police and emergency services, which will usually update on the dronesafetymap.com site and drone assist quickly. So if you see an incident, it might be worthwhile checking. It continues, take particular care not to hinder any aerial support to the emergency services. This could include drones being flown by police, fire, or in a couple of cases in the UK, the ambulance service who now have a fledgling drone presence. 
these drones could be carrying out anything from assisting fire crews on how to contain a blaze or keeping fire crews safe, all the way through to police drones gathering evidence or even 3D modeling an incident. My advice is that it's best to just approach when possible and ask permission to fly. Respect and protect the privacy of anyone involved in the emergency. This is Perhaps an obvious one, nobody wants their most vulnerable moments or worse caught on camera and potentially spread on YouTube. Examples of emergency incidents include road traffic accidents, fires, floods, rescues and similar events. In our recent series of videos with the drone team from the National Police Chiefs Council, we published a video on this exact topic. So if you want more information, there is a link in the description to that video, which explains an awful lot more, including the legislation behind it. Point 10 is another cleanup removing class marks. Point 12 has been expanded to now include lower and fire. To read, never drop, lower or fire anything from your drone or model aircraft while it is flying. There are no extra notes, which I think is intended to keep the point very focused. Next, we jump forward to point 30. Here, the section titled Label All Your Drones and Model Aircraft With Your Operator ID has had content added on how to label your drone. Here it is explained that your operator ID must be visible from the outside or within a compartment which can be accessed without using a tool. So a battery compartment or something, but not if there are any screws to remove, etc. before accessing and reading the number easily. It should be clear and in block capitals taller than three millimeters secure and safe from damage on the main body of the aircraft. So not along the arms of the drone, for instance, as these could get separated from the drone in a crash or incident. Then mopping up points 31 and 33 have had references to class marks removed. So nothing too controversial in the drone code update. And I think many of them do clarify the situation. For me, the inclusion of a single residential building requiring 150 meters separation for drones over 250 grams or without an A2 CFC is probably the most significant change there. To this point, I've always interpreted the area, which is now a word removed from the drone code, to mean at least a row of houses or a small village. What are your thoughts on these changes? Let me know in the comments. Again, this video was created to save you needing to fish through and refresh what the changes in the drone code are. And I hope it was useful to you. If you are new, subscribe and YouTube has chosen this video to show you next. Was it a good choice? Sean out.